Today's guest is Meb Faber. Uh, Meb is the co-founder, CEO, and CIO of Cambria Investment Management, which he launched in 2005. Uh, Cambria manages about two and a half billion dollars as of June 30th. Uh, he also started a podcast uh, eight years ago called the Meb Faber Show. Uh, Meb, we've known each other for some time, and I've been a guest on your podcast, so I'm excited that you can join me on mine. Uh, welcome. Great to be here. Let's kick it off with your background. Uh, you've you've been an investor for a long time, but what originally sparked that investing bug that you now have? You know, I think so much of our path and uh, is determined by just simply w where we were born, what time it was, you know. I was born in the late 70s in Denver, Colorado, so that informs me as a much tortured for many years Denver Broncos fan, right? Like didn't really have any choice in the matter. And uh but had some retribution later. Um you know, the the same thing is true with markets and I think the environment you grew up in, so um and the parents you're born to you know, my father was an engineer, but from a farming background, uh, my mother was uh, a school teacher, had a pretty classic upbringing. But you got to remember, my childhood, their formative adult years was during the 1980s, 1990s. And what was that? That was, that's the best bull market ever, man. Well, I don't know. I, I can say with that asterisk because we're apparently romping and stomping 15 years in now. But uh, an incredible period to be an investor. And um, looking back on that, you know, I think you realize a uh, pretty special time. Anyway, as a kid, you don't know this. Uh, I cut my teeth. I really started to get particularly interested. You know, high school time, E-Trade was coming out. I think uh, if I was a young person today, I would probably be fully in the whole crypto ecosystem. You know, I, I had all the behavioral biases. I'm very overconfident. You give me as much risk as I can take. I'll take it. But, uh, but really kind of became interested during that bull market. So all the names that probably have PTSD for us older folk, you know, the CMGIs, the Lucent Technologies, even the big ones that are still around, the Cisco's and Microsoft's, you know, that that, that was my upbringing. Uh, I went to university as a aerospace and then biotech engineer. And, um, you know, I, I joke and, and I'm totally honest here. I had professors trading stocks during class. Like I very distinctly remember um, this period. And it was a period of uh, it's a lot of fun, by the way, bull markets and these um, these big booms. People always talk about the bubbles and they're worried we're in a bubble. I said, bubbles are so much fun that, you know, that was kind of my formative years, you know, and had I been born somewhere else, we just got back from Japan, you know, Japan, if I was born in Japan in the eighties, nineties, totally different environment than in the U S. So that was kind of the backdrop. I don't know if that was really the answer to the question you're asking. It's so interesting. You know, if you were born in the 1930s, you would be a very different type of person. Um, and, and you kind of wonder it's kind of random, right? You have no control, as you described earlier, when and where you're born and under what circumstances, but that drives kind of who you are. And and the question is, is should it be that way? Uh, should you th try to be objective and think of it as, you know, should I just follow this random path that, that just happened to land on my doorstep or should I re-examine it and, and re recreate my path? And maybe it's not doable. Yeah, I mean, I'm getting ready to offend everyone this early in the podcast. So be forewarned listeners. But, you know, I said on Twitter, I was talking about politics, which you should never do anywhere. But I was like, you know, when you start to identify, there's a great quote from Adam Grant, where he's talking about, I don't want to make my ideas my identity or vice versa. I can't even remember which way it, it is because I keep using the opposite to be true. And so when you identify, my example on Twitter said, you know, you identify as this very specific group. So I, you could just replace it with Denver Bronco fan, right? Like I know the Raiders are terrible. I know, you know, on and on the Chargers are, are garbage. But it knocks your IQ down by let's call it maybe 20 points, right? Because you lose all objectivity. Same thing with Republicans and Democrats. Sorry, I offend both sides. But you same thing with 
investment regimes. So it's very hard to take ourselves out of this body we have and move over to the other perspective, of course. And this applies to so much of investing. But the great example is, you know, talk to my mom all, all throughout, uh, you know, my life. She said, Meb, the way you go about investing is, you, you know, you buy and hold. And you buy great stocks and you hold on to them. And I say, you know, on average, great advice, but particularly great advice during her lifetime. If you go back to what you were talking about, the 1930s, there's a great book called The Great Depression, A Diary. And I recommend all listeners go read this and put yourselves in the shoes of the people who lived through that period. And would you have said, hey, all you do is buy great stocks and hold on to them? Now, that would have been great advice had you been able to withstand and last through that period, right? Um, yeah. But sitting through an 80% decline is easy to say on paper, much harder to, to live through. Morgan Housel, we do a quote of the day on our Twitter thread, and, and Morgan had a great quote that's maybe my favorite Morgan quote. And he said, all past declines look like opportunities, whereas all future declines look like risk, something along those lines. Meaning you look back and you're like, oh man, if I just bought 2009, if I had just put all my money in the day after Black Monday, or if I had, you know, bought up everything like Templeton did in the 1930s, I'd be so rich. But then you look at these future declines, right? And think about your portfolio getting knocked in half, or God forbid, knocked down 80%. That doesn't seem like an opportunity, right? It seems like, oh my God, I'm never going to be able to retire and I'm going to be broke. So, so anyway, so much of this whole experience we have is so, you know, myopically focused. And I think the extrapolation that, that we would probably talk about in the investing world is, you know, you start to see the surveys on what people expect out of their investments. And you and I know the long history of, of returns for markets and stocks, let's call it high single digits, 10% if you round up in the US, maybe if we're very optimistic on a nominal basis. But people were expecting this last cycle and probably again today, 15%, 17%. And, you know, that's, again, extrapolating your own very recent experience into the indefinite future, which is where I think people get into a lot of trouble. So being able to put ourselves in the perspective of someone else, I think is important. You clearly have an interest in learning and educating others about investing. What drives that passion? Well, we don't teach it. You know, my, my, my white whale is what's probably the single most important skill, life skill that everyone needs. We could probably list a few, but, but understanding money is, is up there. Use it every day. And, and I don't know who to attribute this one to, but there was someone mentioned this I heard, and it's like, it doesn't matter if you care about money or not, but money cares about you, meaning you need to make decisions and just saying, I'm not making a decision is a decision. You want to leave your money in the bank at 0%. That's your decision, but you could be getting 5%, right? You want to take on 200,000 in, in debt for university. Okay. But that's going to have on and on and on. Right. And so I think it's a shame we don't teach the basics of money and not just at a high school and college level, but even earlier. And, and, it, and it doesn't have to be the boring econ type of very academic, but more just like practical. And, and I think that's changing. You're seeing, I think the number of high schools is up to about a quarter in the country that teach at least one class of money and investing in personal finance. Um, but anyway, so I didn't learn it growing up, you know, had to be self-taught and, and friends and family reading a lot of books. You know, I remember interning at Lockheed Ma Martin in college and, and as a freshman and it's not so much you can do as an engineer, as a freshman, right? You, you, don't, you haven't learned enough. And so I'd usually be done with my database activities by 10 a.m. And I'd walk around and chat up all the old engineers. And they'd be talking about investings again because this is the late 90s. And, uh, but then I'd spend the rest of the day on the internet reading about investing. And so for me, see, that would have been like Raging Bull, the street.com, uh, you know, the, the modern day Reddit and TikTok, I guess. But you know, I, I think part of the mission and talking about a lot of this is there's also so much disinformation. And look, in every industry, there's the hucksters and the scam artists, but nothing attracts 
that type of people other than the opportunity of giant riches. And so, you know, we certainly see more people getting seduced and poor, uh, poor behavior in our world than, than almost anything. And, you know, the adjacent ones of real estate and other investing sort of uh, uh, cousins too. No, it's a fascinating field, which is one of the reasons that I enjoy speaking and doing a podcast and writing and so on is that there is so much misinformation. Uh, there's, there's so many things out there that sound reasonable and logical, but a lot of what we do in investing, it can be counterintuitive. And I just like talking about those things because one, I think they're interesting. And two, uh, I hope that it's helpful to broaden people's perspective to be better investors. It's an endless playground too. You know, I mean, you can get as deep and as wonky and as academic as uh, you want and spend an entire lifetime on uh, on this topic. And, you know, the older and more experienced you get, you also realize how much randomness is, you know, it's people love to compare investing to all sorts of different sports or games and, and poker being the one that I think is probably the most relatable because it's not just a poor, a, a perfect mathematical exercise. You know, there's humans involved and humans are crazy and humans do crazy stuff all the time. <laughs> so uh, it, it involves that element as well, which is, you know, uh, it makes it more fun and interesting, but adds a, a little bit of humility too, because the, the older investors always know that, you know, you're not going to do a 20% per year up and to the right no volatility, no losing trades type of outcome. You know, even the greatest investors, uh, you know, have plenty of periods where they stink it up too. Uh, well, one day, you know, eight plus years ago, you decided to launch a podcast and you've published over 500 to date, which, which is more than one a week for eight years, uh, which is a pretty major task. Uh, what inspired you to take on this ambitious endeavor and what motivates you to keep it going? You got to, uh, take the timeline back even further, you know, so when we started this company, Cambria, I was in my late twenties, didn't quite want to know what we were going to be when we grew up, you know, now we're an ETF issuer almost exclusively. But when you're bootstrapping a company and starting from scratch, you know, you don't have money for hiring and salaries and marketing and all that good stuff. And you got to get your name out there and your ideas out there and the beauty of uh, where we are today is internet is a giant soapbox for better or worse. And um, so we started out with academic papers. So I wrote my first academic paper. This would have been like 06 when the journal Wealth Management was very lucky with the timing on this. This paper became very popular at the same time, started blogging. So this concept of content was writing on a bunch of different places. And, um, you know, eventually that has morphed into the more socials of Twitter, of YouTube, of TikTok, who knows what's coming next, but the podcast. And, you know, we actually hesitated starting the podcast for a long time. And uh, I really wanted to do, going back to the discussion about the instruction, a, a high produced video series, you know, so think like almost like a master class type of setup, but that takes a lot more effort. And you got to go back again, going back eight years, man, I can't, can't believe it. It's not like you could just log on to Zoom or Riverside and have these great mics and cameras and everything else. Like it was, it was a lot more work back then anyway. Uh, but I was stuck on doing it as purely a video series because I'm a visual learner. And podcasts weren't I mean, a huge thing yet. They were just kind of kind of really taking off. And so I, as I usually do, I go to the wisdom of the crowd and I did a poll. I said, would you guys rather have a very, all things being equal, no cost to you, a highly produced video series with charts and you know everything else visuals or just a podcast and it was like 85 90 percent said podcasts audio only oh okay that's interesting you know and and now we know why it's because people want to listen to it while they're driving they want to speed me up to 2x they're doing it while gardening walking their dog and um and it became obvious so we, we started doing it and look it's a ton of fun it was great experience. Uh, I love just chatting up people on all sorts of wonky and crazy things. And there's endless topics, which uh, allows you to just keep it going for years and years. Hundred percent. Yeah. It, it, it's uh, you know I just saw looking at um, some of the shows. You know, people the niche and and deep depth you can get on certain topics. You know, there's people out there. You want to talk about you know 
uh, craft beers that are focused on sours, like that's probably a giant market somewhere, <laughs> right? It's like people, I think they're disgusting, but someone out, out there likes them. Who knows? So, so let me ask you a, a difficult question. Uh, so you've had these 500 plus episodes. If you had to summarize the key learnings in one sentence, what would you say? My probably second favorite quote on investing, maybe my f- favorite quote that I've been repeating a lot, so bear with me, listeners, if you've heard this, is um, every trade make, makes you richer or wiser, but never both. And this concept of investing um, and humility, you know, I was saying on Twitter, I said, look, if I had to allocate to a discretionary manager, the number one trait I would look for is humility. And you go read a book about Jim Simons, you know, arguably the greatest investor of all time, recently passed away. And you read about the struggles he had certainly in the early days and various times before putting up and even during the greatest track record ever you you look at all the other great investors um and you realize that like this is a game it's like baseball you know it's like it's a game of losing more often than not or going through periods you know we often say um every market is is either at a or an investment is at an all-time high or bear market, like or, or drawdown, excuse me. Is it all-time high or drawdown? There's no in-between, right? So you're either that stock or that investment like the S&P is at an all-time high or it's in some percentage point of, of drawdown. And so the drawdown inco- incorporates the vast majority of the time. You spend most of the time in the drawdown. And you know, it, often it's not much, maybe it's 5 10%, but sometimes it's, it's quite a bit more. So that the concept of the investor's you know, um, having the humility and, and learning from the losers, we call it a failure resume, right? You know, where you put up all the, all, all the mistakes you've made and try to learn something from them. Um, you don't learn as much from your winners. Maybe you do. I don't know. Uh, it feels uh, a lot more fun to have the winners, certainly. But realizing that, you know, the struggles are part of the game, too. And, and that's what, um, you know, getting to the finish line is the whole point. You know, you, you can't get taken out of the, you get taken out of the game, like at the poker table, it's a world series of poker going on right now. You lose all your chips, you're out, can't play anymore. And same is true as investing, right? Like you have to be able to come up with a strategy and a plan that'll keep you, keep you invested. Otherwise, uh, that, that's, that defeats the whole purpose of, of going about it. Yeah. And, and overconfidence can lead to overconcentration, which is the, the biggest risk of, catastrophic loss. That's what all, the great Charlie Munger said it with a little more color, you know, liquors, ladies, and leverage were the three things that he would warn people off and leverage. I mean, how many times have we seen it? We just tweeted out the Archegos uh, story from Bloomberg and you can throw it in the show notes if, if listeners haven't seen it. But I mean, he was 32 billion uh, net worth and zero in a week. And I mean, my goodness, like it, it, like what a crazy, and this has happened many, many times, uh, Batista down in Brazil on and on, you know, that these just going from not just like, it's not like, like a million dollars to zero, you know, it's like 30 billion, 10 billion to zero, uh, is, uh, almost always exclusively due to what you just mentioned, concentration and leverage. Uh, well, maybe you sit in a pretty unique seat because you're a successful investment manager uh, author of several books, frequent speaker at industry events, and uh, you've had the opportunity to interview and learn from some of the brightest minds in the investment world. Uh, so I'd like to hear some of your thoughts uh, in three areas. One is the investment management business, you know, your side of the world, uh, the investment advisory business, uh, which is my side, and then also your thoughts about portfolio construction. So uh, let's start with the investment management industry. Uh, would you give us an insider's look of, of that industry? And what is it about the industry that you feel investors should understand? I feel like I keep channeling um, the, the, the recent dead. Uh, but, uh, but Charlie Munger, you know, again, he's like, such a great quote talking about incentives. And he said, you show me the incentives, I'll show you the outcome. And that applies to so much in our world of investing, where, you know, everyone has some sort of angle, right? And, you know, trying to think about, is this a person or is this relationship that either 
by law has a fiduciary responsibility and they may not get it right. They may not even be good, but at least they have the intent. And, you know, it's like the doctor do no harm, right? Do they have a, a setup that is at least aligned legally? And uh, it's always surprising to investors to realize that um, that's not always the case, right? You know, uh, and, and you, you have to distinguish between the types of relationships you have, just as you would distinguish between a doctor and a nurse practitioner and everyone else involved in the medical field. And so either you want that fiduciary requirement or you at least want the outcomes to be aligned, right? You want, you want to be aligned with someone where their motivations result in a good outcome for you and, and vice versa. They have skin in the game. And, and if they lose, if you lose, they lose too or, or something along those lines. You know, it, it always surprises investors. We talk about the public fund industry quite a bit. And, and I think it's better than the U.S. than almost any other country in the world. So we're, we're I think, um, ahead of most countries. You know, if you look at the mutual fund world, the average mutual fund manager has no money invested in their own fund, which to me is insane because it already breaks that link of what we're talking about, which is, do you have some sort of skin in the game with your investors? And the answer often is no, they don't. And so, okay, well, that seems to me like we're already at odds with where we need to be. So I, I think um, the industry, look, you go back 50 years, uh, Jack Bogle, many others, you know, this, this great trend of fee compression over 50 years, best time ever to be an investor here in 2024, summer of 2024, best time ever to be an investor. You can access low cost, tax efficient products, I mean, if you just wanted to buy the global market portfolio, you can get it for like three basis points. That's 0.03%. Like, God bless you. Um, tax efficient structures on and on. Now, it's also the most dangerous time to be an investor if you want to go light a bunch of dynamite and, you know, buy a bunch of zero day options or multi levered single stock funds. Well, guess good news. The industry is willing to sell you those too. So I, I think the challenge is navigating that. Uh, and, and doing, doing it on your own, and this kind of ties into a little more of your world, if you're doing it on your own, you need that foundation of history and understanding the basics. Because if you don't, then you either get seduced by the dark side, right? The, the prospect of, we, we have a whole Twitter thread of Instagram advertisements that are advertising 50% returns, you know, and um, all these kind of predatory behaviors and it's not in our world right the public fund world is the most heavily regulated and in, in, in the financial advisor world of anything so it's more of the kind of dark private fund world that and it, it always why is it always the real estate guys it ends up being always the real estate guys this cycle i don't know why um and i say guys because our industry is like 90 percent men on the investment side um unfortunately but so anyway um you got to be careful or you hire someone to be, you know, to, to be the coach, to be the quarterback and, and to have, uh, have your back. Right. And, and it goes back to the same comment earlier though. Like you pick the wrong person or you pick someone who doesn't have a fiduciary requirement. It can be problematic too. And you see so many stories of, of people doing things that are totally inappropriate and unfortunate. Mm -hmm. So you have this really tough barbell setup where best time ever to be an investor, but also, you know, it's, it's challenging because you have people coming at you from all sides and, um, particularly doing during the romping stomping signs, we see a lot of bad behavior, you know, bear markets, which are normal and necessary. They help clean out a lot of the, the nonsense, but, uh, you know, we, in the U S at least, we haven't really had one of those in, in quite some time. So, um, that kind of covered both a little bit. So I'm hugely optimistic. I think it's a great time to be an investor as well as in our world. Um, I'm happy to go down any rabbit holes because there's about 10. We could. I'll let you guide guide this uh, discussion. Well, let me, let me ask you about the financial incentives. You touched on that a little bit in the investment management world. So one of the challenges is managers get paid on assets under management. And the more money they manage, the more they get paid. And if they have nothing invested in their own funds, 
then the, the incentives are almost entirely aligned to growing the assets under management, um, which may not necessarily be the best for the underlying investors. There's sort of a mismatch there. I think what you're discussing is very spot on. And, you know, it's like... Um, Everyone loves to just read the headline today, right? You know, there's the, the TLDR. Like, I, I read the headline. I don't even read the article. I get upset about everything. You know, yeah, no, no. The same, tr- same is true in investing. I think it's very important to read past the name of the fund, you know, and, and, and actually, I mean, God forbid, read the prospectus, but, but actually understand what the fund is doing. We live in a, in a kind of a muddled world, right? Uh, 50 years ago, an index meant something very specifically. Active manager meant something else very specifically. And on average, you know, the index fund meant market cap weight, lower costs. Active meant more expensive, discretionary, cowboy, stock picker. And today that 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 is is completely muddled. But you know, we were talking recently, we said, look, there's there's an index fund that we know, and it's $10 billion, and but it's focused on investing in small caps. And because it's an index fund and they didn't design it in a way that foresaw it being $10 billion, that fund is now buying 10, 20, 25% of the shares outstanding of various stocks. And if you know anything about markets, you know that's a lot. And you're going to be moving those stocks, I don't know, five percentage points each way. And so what I'm referring to, listeners, is you know, flows can change the underlying composition. And, and the most recent, and there's been hundreds in history of this, but certainly was uh, the ARC fund, you know, Kathy Wood, you know, where you have an ETF and as assets flood in, it's, it's buying those stocks and pushing them up. And, and that's a reflexive process. And on the flip side, when the money comes out, it does the opposite. And so, you know, there's sometimes that structures are not necessarily the best setup and and investors we put out an article recently and let me preface this by saying listeners we love vanguard we use vanguard funds jack bogle deserves to be on the mount rushmore hall of fame whatever accolade you want to give him he's he's numero uno that having been said we wrote an article called and this references prior generation there used to be a phrase called no one gets by no one gets fired for buying ibm And because we're referencing it being the safe decision. If you're a purchasing manager, you're running a tech department, you partner with IBM, you don't get fired, right? Like it's like Microsoft today or something, Google. But we wrote this article and implied to our financial advisory world. We said, nobody gets fired for buying Vanguard, dot, dot, dot. Maybe they should be. And, And what we were trying to imply is, again, going back to reading the headline, you know, Vanguard has a fund at the time was 20 billion. And we said, if you just read the headline of this fund, you would think it would be X. But I said, because it's so big, it can't really concentrate in the way that it, you would think it might be able to. And we showed how it performed. And then we wrote this in 2018. It's 2024, so five plus years later. And we walked forward. And it turned out that, you know, this other choices, and we were using our fund as an example, you know, did much better. But still looking at the underlying metrics and factors of it. But guess what? That fund's now 80 billion. <laughs> so first of all, what do I know? <laughs> you know, like they they clearly are much better at raising assets, but just the math alone of that structure, you know, you can't concentrate. You are the market. You are market cap weight at that point. And so I, I think um that's sort of hard for investors to to really you got you got to dig deep, unfortunately, um, and and really understand what the product is doing, what the strategy is doing, and you know it. it Vanguard, at least, God bless them, you know, tends to run their funds closer to cost. Where you know, as they get bigger, they do reduce fees. Most fund managers don't, and and I think uh, um, that's a shame. And also, if you think about it, as an investor, you're investing in a fund. The onus is on the fund manager to decide, you know, at this at this level, we can't continue to generate the returns we have in the past. So we should close our fund, not accept more capital. And uh, I've seen some funds return capital. But then there's a disincentive to do that because the bigger your fund, the more you make uh, for uh, your, yourself and your firm. And so that, that conflict uh, can 
be challenging for the end investor, particularly since it's not easy to to see it from the outside. Yeah, I mean, how many hedge funds have we seen where they have twenty percent of performance fees? They get into a big drawdown. They just shut down the fund, and then six months later, they're like we're launching a new fund. <laughs> like, how could you possibly, you know, unless you get some sort of discount on that next fund? Like, come on, man! Like, you're just you're just restarting. Like, you can't you're just turning the computer on and off. Uh, that doesn't seem fair to your old investors, but it happens time and time again. Uh, the, the other challenge in the investment management world. Uh, that that I've noticed, and you probably have as well, is there's a tendency for investors to go and invest in the particularly actively managed fund, to invest in the actively managed fund that has outperformed the last three, five, 10 years. And inevitably, they underperform the next three, five years, and then they terminate that manager and then hire the one they should have hired five years earlier. And you repeat, repeat the cycle. And one simple measure is just looking at the time way to return versus the dollar way to return. And typically, investors earn is a lot less than what the funds have earned on a time-weighted basis. What, would, would you talk about that? We have a whole thread on this on Twitter where Vogel had this in one of his books where he was looking at you know, the, the top managers of each decade and then how they did the next decade. And not surprising, you already know the punchline, you know, they underperformed. And we did the same thing with the Morningstar does like the mutual fund managers of the decade. Same thing, right? Um, they do amazing. And then the next, next regime, they do poorly. I think this applies certainly to, I mean, it's it's most, it shows up most in active managers because they tend to be more concentrated. So you have the outliers, it's like the distribution, you have more uh, uh, on the upside, but also the ones on the downside just close down. So like it's it's almost, I think it's 50%, five zero, half of all public funds close or emerged over the course of a decade which is an astonishing number. So, you know, in 20 years, that like entire universe is totally recycled. So you have that sort of survivor bias where people don't see all the ones that just close up shop. And, but I think it's true with, with uh, assets as well. You know, we did this recent article called the bear market and diversification. And if you're a financial advisor listening to this, like it, it might be a little PST, PTSD, which we wrote about, which is if you go back to the bottom in 2009, and um, the U.S. stock market has done 15% compounded since March 2009. Unbelievable, right? Just, just creamed. One of the best periods in history. If you, if you compound at 15% for long periods, like you become rich pretty quick. However, if you had invested in any asset allocation strategy, so it could be the endowment model, it could be 60-40, it could be risk parity, permanent portfolio, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what it was. First of all, they did just fine. So I don't know, 6-7% on average which relative to inflation, that 4% probably over inflation is, is in line because it was a low inflationary period. You know, inflation is much higher now. And so the challenge was, this has arguably been, we look at this for the past 100 years, all these different types of asset allocation strategies. If, if not the number one, then maybe number two, and the only comparable period is post-World War II in terms of, absolute level of underperformance relative to the, to the S&P. And the hardest part, if anyone knows anything about investing for long periods, it's, it's not the absolute underperformance, it's the consistency of underperformance. So it's something like most of these strategies underperform the S&P 12, 13 of the past 15 years, and in like 10 in a row, right? So it's like every Christmas, every Thanksgiving, you have Cousin Eddie over here, who's just put all his money in the S&P or NVIDIA. And every year he's like, you do this for a living? Like, why? Like, why are people paying you? I just put all my money in SPY. And then you have all the reasonable things to say to him. You say, you know, he's like, like, you invest in foreign stocks? Are you an idiot? Like, who would invest in foreign stocks? Diverse, like, he's like, global diversification. Like, that's crazy. Like, why would you invest in any other country than your own? And I'm like, well, you know, just to be clear here, globally diverse diversified portfolio even just stocks has worked in like 44 or 45 countries it just hasn't worked in one and it hasn't worked in one this cycle i guarantee you if you're greek or brazilian or japanese or chinese or a brit or australian and you said hey i actually globally diversified for the past 15 years you did vastly better now largely because you had a huge chunk in the us right but that's, you know, the cycles flip anyway. So I think people extrapolate the, the biggest disconnect probably in all of investing 
is that investors want short-term results and certainty, right? Like they, they want their returns and they want them now. And so, you know, they, they are so used to this instant feedback that they believe that if you buy something, doesn't matter if it's active manager or stock, you should know or you should see the returns, I don't know, this month, this year. But it could easily go three, five, even 10 years. Now, we had Ken French on the podcast recently, and he said 64 years. He's like, statistically speaking, you need 64 years to tell if they're any good. I think that's a little too long. I think you need less than 64. But it goes back to this just entire challenge of chasing the hot returns. And, and active managers, it's easy because they, they tend to have a little more of a outlier, but it happens in indexes, it happens in countries, assets, on and on. And almost always, like you've, you've read all the same academic literature I have, like it, it works against you. you. You almost always end up doing it at the wrong time. My favorite example is Ken Hebner, CGM, who had amazing returns on a time-weighted basis, but on a dollar-weighted, it was like 20% a year. On a dollar-weighted, it was uh, not 20, it wasn't even 10, it was, it was negative. Because then everybody uh, piled in after uh, after he had his hot run and then lost seventy percent immediately thereafter. Yeah, it's it's one of the hardest things in investing because we can see the historical returns, and it's easy to project that into the future because most of the world works like that. Past performance is indicative of future results in most of the world. You know, if you have a out- outperforming employee, they're likely outperform in the future, and like you know, and vice versa. So it is very counterintuitive in that way, and it can really catch you off guard. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and the challenge is if you look at something even as, as simple as the S&P, you know, it's, you're getting a stream of all future cash flows. And so if you're at a period where right now we think that US stocks are market cap weighted pretty expensive, you're simply pulling some of the future returns into the present. So if you've been in the last 15 years, God bless you, pat yourself on the back. Like you've, you've realized that return. But on average, and again, you could go back to Bogle, wrote a paper about this in the 90s, where you could kind of draw up your broad expectations about what, what markets should do. Um, you know, the flip side is, is also true. If, if something's been stinking it up, down, and the market goes down 40, 60, 80%, super cheap, like that's, that's probably on average uh, the time that, that that should look really good. A lot harder to do, of course. That's for sure. That time seems to take longer in markets than it does in most of the world. Uh, Well, you've been in the industry a long time and you know a lot of financial advisors. So let's talk about the financial advisory industry. Would you share some of your key insights into this, you know, part of the investment world for our listeners? Yeah. You know, um, I think financial advisors are worth their weight in gold. I think, however, you know, I I think the asset allocation decision is really table stakes. And, you know, in a world where you can buy an asset allocation ETF, you and I both run one, uh, or you can buy a basket of ETFs, that's like the default already. That's the foundation. So you better bring something to the table if you're a financial advisor charging 20, 50, 100 150 basis points, whatever it may be, you better be able to add add something. And my belief is the vast majority of the value add is not on optimizing the excess return of that portfolio. Now, I think optimizing the tax efficiency of that portfolio, optimizing it for the client's goals and desires, I think the vast majority of the value add for many in the wealth management financial advisory business is the litany of other value added ideas. It's tax management, it's behavioral coaching, it's taxes, filing taxes, being a CPA, it's estates and trusts and wills, all the other basics, blocking and tackling that I think a lot of people don't do or certainly don't optimize. I mean, it, it just the simple fee and tax discussion alone we spend so much time on is way sexier to me than the actual investment management side. But that's what everyone spends 99% of the time talking about on Bloomberg and CNBC and elsewhere. 
you know, we were saying the other day, the other day, it's now like five years ago, probably on Twitter, the decision to move from the average mutual fund to the average ETF is probably at least a 70 basis point up to about a percent and a half benefit alone. So you got just the difference in the average mutual fund and the average ETF. So that right there is like 70 basis points. Average mutual fund, and this isn't dollar weighted, this is just the average cross numbers is 125. And then the tax benefit, particularly if you're in a taxable high state like us, you know, and you're doing equities and you're doing equity turnover, you're adding on quite a bit more. And so just that basic decision, like you're not like how many people were, you know, still we we still see the mutual fund salad portfolios where somebody comes over and here, Meb, here's my 40 mutual funds I own. And I said, My God, that's uh that's unfortunate, you know, um, because you you you're in this legacy anyway. You know, I I think that the boring tax is always like my number one tax and fees. Those are things we can control and and really optimize in a way that I think uh, most people eyes glaze over. They think about taxes about once a year, and that's usually when they you know they have to write a check in in April or whenever it is now. That's my that's my big uh, thought on that. Now I, we, again we could go deeper in certain areas, but. Um, I think the advisory business is a future-proof business that you know is going to be around for a long time, uh, but it's one that I think uh, the majority of the value add is not as much on the investment management space as people think. And probably a lot of it is just helping people avoid the big mistakes that we often see. You know, you're supposed to buy low and sell high, and most people buy high and sell low. So just helping people reduce the tendency to do that is probably very beneficial over time. We have an old paper called the investing pyramid, which harkens back to the days of the old food pyramid. And and we were kind of talking about how, you know, when I was a kid, the food pyramid, the thing you're supposed to eat the most of was carbs. It was like on the in and look at the pyramid. It's like cereal, pasta, you know, all these things that now it's like inverted, right? It's like you probably shouldn't be loading up on frosted flakes to fruit loops all morning. And the same thing was kind of true with investing. And we kind of talked about like what it meant to be an investor 50 years ago and what does it mean today and what's the foundation and kind of what are the main steps you should do in order. And, you know, number one is, is that do no harm. Like don't do the really stupid things first. Like that, that like seems to be like the number one, don't get taken out of the game. And then it's kind of, you know, doing the steps in order, uh, I think is, is a thoughtful way to think about it. Uh, so if we look at the way the investment advisory business is set up, uh, if you if we were starting from scratch and it didn't exist and you had the opportunity to whiteboard it, uh, how would you set it up? This is asset management or, or the more the planning side? The investment advisory. So like my, my side of the business. I love the concept of stating very clearly, like almost like the nutrition information on the back of a soft drink or food you know, here's what you're signing up for. And I think most investors, you know, you ask them, I think they just assume that most people in the financial world by, by law and regulations have to have their best interests in mind. And that's not true, right? Which is kind of crazy if you think about it. So I, I think that should be like a very clearly worded designation uh, where you say, look, this person, registered investment advisor, whatever you want to call them, is like, they have to, by law, at least attempt to have your best interests in mind. You know, and that if you want to have all these others who can do all these things, like, go have at it. You know, I, I think that to me would be like number one. And then like, very clear, like, no industry, no other industry has as much jargon as we do. My God. And so just like very clearly have just this statement, you know, this is what you're going to get charged. This is why, blah, blah, blah. I think if you're an entrepreneur out there, I'm still shocked that there's not a well-developed Yelp or ZocDoc for our world. You know, how do most people find us? It's they ask their friend and their friend says, oh, man, man, been a client of Alex's forever, playing golf. He's amazing. Same thing, like, oh, he's a real crazy shop down in Manhattan Beach that does asset management, been investing with them. You know, that, that's how they arrive. But 
you know, Google search is probably not the best way to go about finding, you know, someone you're entrusting your entire life savings to, right? So I think there's opportunity there that I'm surprised that hasn't, hasn't quite happened yet. So I think having that clear accreditation and distinctions would be important. Um, after that, I think there's all litany of ideas, but that, that to me is the number one. I, I think the, the, we have a big problem in the U.S. of we wrote an old article called How to Narrow the Wealth and Income Gap in the U.S. And, and one of them was to teach education, uh, teach investing in personal finance and money in schools, so education. Another was, you know, our retirement system is a little cobbled together. you got Roth IRAs, IRAs, 401ks, on and on and on. And, and doing something similar to what like Australia does with their superannuation funds where, you know, you, you just X percentage of your earnings go straight into these retirement strategies uh, that are invested. And you ask people in Australia and they all have these giant balances because they've been, you know, mandated and required to save a little bit, uh, I think is a really thoughtful way to go about it. And we don't do that in the U.S. We kind of tie it to employment. And it's just, it's, it's too damn confusing. All this, our entire world, just good headline, just be too damn confusing for most people. And so just trying to simplify it and trying to get everyone invested. I, I, I really struggle. There's a chart. The anonymous Jesse Livermore, uh, who used to talk about this, where it's the percent of assets, household assets that are allocated to stocks in the United States over time, right? And then it goes waxes and wanes. And usually it's up and down with the markets. And I struggle with it because I want everyone to be an investor. You know, the the um, Brad Gerstner at Altimeter talks a lot about this, this concept of uh, not a baby bond, but a baby investment. You're born in the US, you get thousand, five thousand bucks, whatever, invest in the stock market. You know, I, I love that idea. I think it's fantastic. So I want everyone to be an investor. Now, the struggle with this chart, of course, is at this point in 2024 is US stocks on our average are expensive. So this this recently hit the highest it's ever been, right? So the, the two other peaks were, you know, 2000, 2021 and, and today. So it's it's conflicting because I want everyone to be an investor. I want everyone to put all the, you know, invest uh, this concept to be the owner. But at the same time, know that uh, kind of on the sentiment side, when everyone's clamoring and putting all their money in, usually the, the future returns stink. So I don't know. I'd say the industry has gotten better over the last three or four decades. If you go back, you know, you had people selling stocks and they really didn't know what they were talking about, but they were selling stocks and getting commissions. And then it evolved to an advisory fee. And, and, and so it's, I think, getting better, but very slowly. Um, and I think if we were to start from scratch, a lot of what you see probably wouldn't exist. You'd kind of fast forward maybe a decade or so where it's very, very objective, uh, you know, very transparent, simple, easy to understand, and so on. I think you're spot on. I, I think it, uh, it takes longer than I think you and I would both hope. But the arrow of progress is moving in the right direction. I mean, you can look at the every year, you know, we're saying ETFs are eating the asset management industry. But on average, and, and there's nothing, there are some magical and special things about ETFs, but on average, they're just a structure. But it really is just comes down to that total after tax fee, right? And, and just cost. And on average, every year, it's just every year just moving down, which is wonderful. And the rest of the world is miles behind. You look at some of these countries where a lot of these investment products are linked to, you know, banks and they cost two and a half, three percentage points to get invested in some of these products. Um, and it's not just like tiny countries like Japan and Canada, et cetera. You look at some countries where no one invests. A lot of Europe, you know, most of the people out there aren't investors, right? They 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 don't really invest to the same extent Americans do. And so I think um we're we're leading the charge and uh maybe that's why the US is <laughs> soon to be 70% of world market cap. I don't know. But um I think it's, it's moving in the dire right direction. But but that's the thing about money is it it, it doesn't go back to the places it was treated poorly. So uh, we say the two big things is death and divorce. So if you got 50 mutual funds at one and a half percent and your father or grandfather dies or you get divorced and those get liquidated, no one wakes up and is like, I'm going to buy those 50 mutual funds again. No chance. Like they go buy the uh, broad portfolio of ETFs. And so many investors – 
get stuck on this where they say, oh man, I just got these legacy positions. I got this big tax basis. And I say, well, you know how much this one and a half percent is costing you per year just to stick around? It's costing you a fortune. And so there's actually c coming up with, stay tuned, uh, some really innovative ideas, you know, where you can kind of um, move from highly taxable positions into diversified funds. We've had these exchange funds for many years, and now you're starting to see it in the ETF world, which I think in 2024, the balance of the year, you'll start to see some even more innovation here. So it's, it's again, it's a great time to be moving away from a lot of the garbage. But so, so many people make decisions based on tax alone and end up in a far worse place, right? Uh, so, but I, I think that is one positive trend moving in the right direction. Uh, well, let's transition to your investment framework uh, and talking about how to build a portfolio efficiently. But what would you say are the main goals of a portfolio? Let's start there. Um, the first one that trumps everything else is, is this mental mindset of being the owner. And what do I mean by that? You know, I, I have a lot of non-consensus views in some are much more out there than others, but but the most important one in my mind at its core, if you look at all the top celebrities and athletes, for example, make a ton of money, it could be Dr. Dre, it could be Dolly Parton, it could be Ryan Reynolds, on and on. They actually didn't, none of them made their big money from their career. Now they made decent money, Jay-Z, right? Made decent money from rapping and Dolly Parton made decent money from singing and athletes. Michael Jordan is probably my favorite example. But where did they make their real money? Like the big get rich money is from business. It was business or investing 99% of the time. And so this concept of being the owner, being an investor, there's a million different ways to do it, right? So, you know, we sit down and we, we wrote an old book about this. We're trying to update it this year called Global Asset Allocation. It's free to download. But we looked at all these different asset allocation portfolios. And the big takeaway to me was that there's plenty of ways to get rich. You know, there's people out there say, I'm a dividend person or I'm a real estate person. And I, I think this applies to housing too. I often say, you know, the reason that so many people use it, why my mom bought this house for a hundred grand and now it's two million. Look how great this return was. And in most cases, I say it's actually not even the return that's that out there, it's the decision to have invested. So real estate's great because it's forced investing. You get a mortgage, like you have to pay it, right? And if you didn't have the mortgage, what would most people do with it? They would spend it. They'd buy a new F-150 or Tesla or they'd go on a vacation or you know, go out to dinner, pop some bottles at a club, I don't know. And the same thing is true with reasons why target date funds are so successful 401ks, where it's that automated and, and back to the superannuation in, in Australia, forced savings. And so I think as long as you get the basics right, so the, the goal of just getting that money in there and, and automating this is always better than not, enforcing it, right? So you don't even see it. It just skims off every month, whether it's a hundred bucks, thousand bucks, 10,000 bucks. And starting today, right? That's the big one. The, the compounding, we always try to tell the young people, say, look, you get 10% returns per year. doesn't sound like much. 25 years, you know, you 10 extra money and 50 years, it's 100x. Like think about that, 100x. You put in 100 grand, that's going to be worth 10 million. And, you know, that's uh, people are like, well, it's hard to come up with 100 grand, sure, but like that compounds. Anyway, so I don't think it really matters what you put your money into. So that's the first kind of weird comment. Um, but you want to diversify it across the three main buckets in my mind, which is global stocks, global bonds and global real assets, meaning like real estate, tips, commodity, sort of linked things. And I don't think the proportions matter that much. They'll matter in any given year. So in this book, we looked at all these asset allocation strategies. In any given year, the top performing strategy versus the worst would vary by like 30 percentage points. So that's why people end up chasing whatever the hot strategy is, right? But over time, they, they all end up kind of in the same place, which is astonishing takeaway. And so I, I think it doesn't really matter. And then after that, you know, that's the basics. You can implement that low cost, tax efficiently, all-in-one ETF, basket of ETFs, boom, you're done right there. That, that to me is like the investing pyramid, like first like nine levels of the pyramid. Now, 
are there things I think you can do on top of that that are particularly important? I do. Well, what's interesting about what you just said is, at least in my experience, most people don't do that. They have a portfolio that is not that well diversified. It's heavily concentrated, perhaps today more than normal. And it's almost like violating the first rule of investing has become convention. Almost everyone, you know, does the, I'm all in on the stocks in my own country. So in the U.S., I mean, it's, it's getting even more, more and more extreme, but everyone owns U.S. stocks. Like that, that's the, I don't, I don't know that I've ever met an investor, certainly a professional investor that's an allocator, particularly on your side of the fence, that doesn't own U.S. stocks. Now, there may be one account for like grandma. She's like, hey, I'm just going to put her in CDs, whatever. But on average, everyone owns U.S. stocks, right? And U.S. stocks with almost the entire portfolio. They may own a, a sprinkling of, of foreign stocks, but it seems you can forget about emerging markets. That's, that's not even consideration at this point. Um, and then they own some U.S. bonds, right? And then, but as the percentage of the world, you know, people always forget U.S. is a percentage of world GDP is like a quarter. U.S., the, the people are always surprised the majority of global GDP is in emerging markets. Um, the vast majority of population is certainly in emerging markets. But these other parts of the portfolio, the big one that's usually missing is the real asset side. Now, caveat, most people own a house that are investors. And so that house definitely contributes a, a real asset portion, but it's extremely non-diversified, right? You're on one block in one city in one part of the country. Um, so on average, getting the basics right with the diversification, I think, is important. And, and that means global stocks. So right now, U.S. is 60-ish percentage of the world, maybe two-thirds. Foreign bonds are actually bigger than U.S. bonds on average. And then the, the real assets, I think, is, is the most important in that. Now, once you get those basics covered, and that's good, you know, um, then you can move on to other things like tilting towards value, which we do, tilting towards trend, uh, which we do, and, and kind of getting the periphery right. But most people, like you mentioned, and this is also true around the world, the home country bias is very re real still. If you're in Japan, if you're in UK, if you're in Australia, you put all your money in your own country, which is totally insane. You know, and you look at all the charts on this, and it's just like the biggest head scratcher ever. But people, people like to invest, you know, going back to the very beginning of the discussion, like I'm a Broncos fan, I will never, ever be a Raiders fan. So I like to cheer for and it feels comfortable to me it feels like i understand and know it and uh that's that's my people and the same same is true as investing people if you're in brazil you're going to invest in brazilian stocks right because that feels like you really know them you, you know it's it's warm and comfy but it's historically an absolutely horrific idea uh it's one of the worst things you can do is put all your money in one country and the list of uh why that's true is is endless including the u.s Right. Earlier, you mentioned two things you can be sure of are beneficial, keeping your fees as low as you can um, for what you're getting and trying to minimize taxes. The other that I would add is diversification. It's, a, it's like, a, you know, they talk about the one free lunch in investing is diversification. You can basically get similar returns for less risk or greater returns for same risk by being properly diversified, yet so few people are properly diversified. It's really fascinating. It's particularly apparent this cycle, right? Because when the big, the big one in the room, the S and P, is the one that's shining, it becomes, I think, in, it, particularly in the U.S., particularly um, apparent, right? Now, if if like REITs or the long bond or something was doing this for 10, 15 years, it's not as I feel like a you know a, a, a apparent situation, but particularly when it's the the S and P, and and this year, I mean, my goodness, not only has it been going on for fifteen years, then you have something like this year where I think, you know, small caps are down on the year, uh, you, mid caps are flat, if not down, and the S and P is up what fifteen percent. We're recording this kind of earliest July, uh, and you got a, a handful of stocks that are just you know propping this up. I think it's uh it's it's challenging for sure, for a lot of people not to just put it on and all in on a uh, US. Yeah. So let, let me ask you about that. So if you're investing for the next five, 10, 15 years, why wouldn't an investor just buy the S&P? You know, it's low cost. You can basically get it for free, low taxes, low headache. Why don't they just 
buy that and just hold it for 10, 15 years? Why, why worry about trying to be more complicated with your portfolio? First of all, I think it's, it's fine. If you look at the long list of things that are totally fine, I put that in this bucket. But if you look at the long list of things that are absolutely horrific, I don't put that necessarily in this bucket. I don't think it's a good idea. And I, don't, I think it, it will be potentially extremely problematic. There's people out there that not are paying three basis points for the S&P. Or they're paying one, one and a half, right? So that's like, that's in the not okay bucket. But here's the problem with that. So you go back 50 years. When people really started to do market cap investing, Bogle, Wells Fargo, others, you know, that this was a neutron bomb that went off in the asset management industry. And fantastic, in a good way. I don't, I don't know how you make that analogy. In a good way, it, but it just destroyed all these high fee, do nothing shops, and is continuing to reverberate today. But it's, it's actually not the market cap indexing that was the innovation. Now, market cap indexing means you invest the most and the biggest and the least and the smallest companies by market cap weighting, but there's no tether to fundamentals. But because you don't do anything, if you're a market cap investor, you just buy it and you don't actually ever rebalance. I mean, you do corporate actions, but otherwise you just let them float. So you don't need anyone. You don't need any employees, <laughs> really. And so you're able to offer that for a low fee. So really, it's the low fee part that really was the huge innovation. But 50 years forward, you can now do any sort of other indexing or active management strategy in an ETF wrapper and have it be tax efficient. So you could do equal weight, for example. Let's say you equal weighted the S&P 500. Well, historically, that beats the S&P. It's like one of the easiest ways to beat the S&P is you just break that market cap link because the top stocks in the S&P, so if you look at, say, the top 10, historically, they underperform the S&P. Now, it's not a huge amount, but let's call it like half a percent or something. So you just either eliminate those, and we have some charts on Twitter that talk about this, uh, because most of the time, it's totally normal. But when you have these euphoric bubble periods, the stocks that go that get the biggest and go up the most then have the biggest weight. And then if you think globally is an easier way to, to, I think, visualize it, you know, US in 1999, the most expensive it's ever been, well, it was the biggest part of the world's market, right? It was the largest stock market. In the 1980s, Japan, which hit a long-term P ratio of, two, of 100, almost 100, was the biggest stock market in the world. So you put most of the money in the US, uh, the Japanese stock market. And so it's the same true within indices. And there's been a lot of research out there that demonstrates if you just simply got rid of the top stock, you know, the top stock underperforms that index, usually by about three percentage points per year for the next decade, right? So it's you have this situation that historically, it's not a good idea to market cap weight. However, <laughs> GMO's got my favorite chart on this. It looked at the top 10 stocks versus the other 490. And on average, again, a terrible idea. Underperforms by, I don't let's make it up 2% a year. But every once in a while, you get this face ripper period of 5, 10 years where those stocks just go absolutely nuts. And usually it's in the bull market crescendo. And, uh, and then they beat by 5% a year or something. And that's kind of here we are, right? Now, this is, goes back to the beginning of our discussion and what makes this so much fun and challenging is that like, that doesn't have to stop here at a long-term P-E ratio of 35. The U.S. hit 45 and 99, and again, Japan hit 100. So there's nothing, there's no stop sign that says you have to, this bull market has to end here. And, and the same is true on the opposite side, right? The P-E in the U.S. has been as low as five a couple of times. But on average, if you're a betting person and, and the prob probability weighted, future returns should be lower for market cap weighted. So if you look at things like value, we do shareholder yield. It looks incredible relative to the overall market. The spreads, all the, all the big quants like to talk about this, whether it's top decile, top two deciles. I think it really peaked in February 21. It's a great time to be moving away from the market cap weight, and that could add returns to that traditional portfolio. So yes, um, if someone's going to put it in an S&P and just live with it, it's probably going to be okay. I don't think they're going to do the historical 10%. They may do five, but it's not zero. Uh, but I think if you tilt it toward things like value, tilt it towards foreign and emerging, which on average are, are much cheaper, uh, 
And then the one way to protect yourself on kind of the, what should we call this? The, the euphoric hedge would be to have an allocation to trend as well, which I, I think is the, the one big thing that most institutions don't do that I think would be the number one thing to add to a traditional buy and hold diversified portfolio once you get to that point. But SPY is not the worst thing. It's just not the best thing. Yeah, I think one helpful way to think about it is it's all probabilities. So the probability that just buying the S&P 500 gives you a good return for the next five to 10 years is probably low given how expensive it is, but it's not zero. So it could continue to run, but it's just that the more it runs and it outperforms its historical average, the lower the odds of good performance from that point forward. And, and likewise, if you're buying cheaper things or being more diversified, your odds of success just increase and you're spinning that wheel and you're playing the odds. My favorite way to illustrate this is if we simulate quantitatively U.S. stocks, just two simple buckets. They're expensive, they're cheap. And then are they in an uptrend or downtrend? Something like the 200-day moving average. Very, very basic. Go back 100 plus years. The best quadrant is a cheap uptrend, which is not surprising. The worst is a expensive downtrend. Again, not surprising. But the second best is the expensive uptrend, which is where we are now, right? So stocks are expensive, but they're continuing to go up. And so the, the trend following type of strategies, I think, are a hedge against uh, your neighbor, right? So listening to that, Cousin Eddie just yap on about how much money he's making in NVIDIA and S&P. Well, at least the trend gives you, you know, some exposure to that. The rebalancing, like you mentioned, I, I think is a thoughtful way to trim those positions. Because if, if you just have a U.S. stocks and bonds portfolio, or even a diversified portfolio, and you never touch it, you know, it, it gets offsides, right? The, the U.S. stock portion, if it goes up for 15 years relative to everything else, it's getting to be the biggest weight relative to the rest of the portfolio, probably when you least want it to be. So that systematic rebalancing, I think, is a thoughtful, and I don't think it matters how specific you do it, as long as you do it at some point. It could be every year, it could be every couple of years, but you got to do it at some point. Otherwise, you just end up all in and at a time when you don't want to be. And then I think one of the biggest things to think about in constructing a portfolio is what's your goal? And, and probably more practically, what's the reference point? So you can judge success or failure. And I think there's a tendency for the reference point to be US stocks and more specifically the S&P. Because you ask somebody how the market's doing, they're going to quote the S&P. And that's what's on CNBC and the Wall Street Journal. And if you have a portfolio that is very different from that because it's more diversified, then you can go through a long stretch like we have the last 5, 10, 15 years where you feel like you're not doing well. And also, if you don't have a goal, we talk a lot about this where you should write down an investing plan. If you're partnered with an advisor like yourself, obviously you do, but a lot of investors who are winging it, you know, if you don't have a goal, the answer ends up just being more, right? Like you don't have a reference point. And the problem with no reference point is you have no rudder or tiller, I guess you'd say, foundation where you have to base your decisions upon. And, and then it just becomes the, the, the vast majority of investors that, you know, going back to when you buy a fund, you know, buy a fund and I'm just going to wing it, you know, and, and that's probably the absolute worst way to go about it because you're, your emotions creep in. What are you going to do when it's down 10%, 20, 50, right? And so if you don't have an investing plan, if you don't have the goals set up, I think it uh, becomes a huge problem. And it's not just when things go wrong. It's also when things go right. Something doubles. What are you going to do, right? Are you going to let it ride? Are you going to, uh, you know, something goes up 10x. How, you know, you got an investment, single stock. That thing's a 50 bagger. How are you going to think about it? It can be stressful on that side too. It's a better problem to have than down, down 70%, but it happens. Yeah, and I think another way to think about it is if you have a plan and you have a, a sense of, how things will may perform in the future, at least a range of expectations. And when they perform within that range, maybe you don't overreact. If you don't have that, th those kind of ground rules established up front, you're much more likely to respond to your emotional uh, reactions to uh, returns. And as, as we know, that tends to lead you in the wrong direction. Um, so, so you talked about, in terms of portfolio construction, having global equities, global fixed income, and real assets, you know, those inflation hedges. 
how do you think about other invest investments like private assets or hedge funds? We love to um, take a historical simulation approach with a lot of the assets, and I, I love to pick fun and and you know post things on Twitter. One we posted the other day was, you know, people out there love to identify with their tribe. So my Canadian and Aussie friends, my goodness, they love gold, right? But other people, their bond, fixed income folks, whatever, stock, stock bulls, dividend, aristocrats, on and on. But I was trying to make the point the other day. I said, you know, if you did the blind studies, the old Pepsi Coke taste tests, where you actually didn't look at the name of the asset. You just put in the metrics historically, said, okay, you got to make decisions. I think people would come up with totally different outcomes, right? They would come up with totally different conclusions. Like if you put the statistics of a diversified portfolio versus the S&P, no one would choose the S&P. Zero people would choose the S&P, right? But then how many people do or, or versus 60-40? And so it's a fun simulation and test to do with investors. And, and one that I was doing on Twitter the other day that stirred up the pot a little bit is I said, all right, you got a 60-40 portfolio, the foundation, the global benchmark. Let's just replace the entire 40%. So that's 60% U.S. stocks, S&P 500, 40% government bonds. I use 10-year U.S. government bond. I go, let's do something crazy. Let's just replace all the bonds with gold. Like that's a horrible idea, Right. And it turns out it literally makes no difference. You could go back 30 years. And then, of course, I did it, whatever, the first one I posted, forget, 30 years, 40 years, whatever it was. And I was like, yeah, yeah, but this is such a specific period. I go, it doesn't matter. Go back 100 years. It doesn't matter. Now, it's better to have both. But, but my point being is that when you do some of these simulations and think, it, it goes back to what you're talking about. Is like, what is the role of this investment? And... I think there's kind of two categories, right? So the less investments you have, so if you just have the S&P, it's easy to add things that improve upon that return stream. You know, you add bonds, you add real assets, and it's very clear to demonstrate what that adds. Now, once you get to that diversified portfolio benchmark, the bar is a lot higher, right? And so you say, okay, well, it's either got to do one of two things. It's got to add returns, right? You know, you want it to be something that's uh, offense, really thinking about. So it's better in some sense. And whether you have a significant amount of confidence in that, or it's got to be a diversifier. So is it going to zig and zag when this por- rest of the portfolio is, is, is doing poorly? Or a combination of both. That's like kind of the holy grail, right? And then, of course, being honest about it on an after-tax basis or somehow does it improve taxation, et cetera. And so, you know, I, I think a lot of people, they'll have a portfolio and they'll spend all this time on this investing idea fund and they'll be like, all right, I'm going to swap this out. It's like 1% allocation. Like also, <laughs> that's not going to do anything. Like almost never would that have any impact. So, you know, are you going to allocate 5 10%, et cetera? You know, to me, the number one thing that we look at relative to, so if you, what do most people do? They don't own any foreign stocks. They don't own any foreign bonds. They don't own any real assets. So let's assume you've done all these things already. You got a diversified portfolio. I think that uh, the number one for me, and I'm an outlier here, is trend following type of strategies. So some people would call this managed futures. Some people would call it uh, lots of other variants. I think on average, these types of strategies are one of the best diversifiers to a traditional portfolio, particularly during the bad times, the long bad times, not necessarily the short bad times, but long bear markets, particularly in US stocks. The biggest weakness of a traditional portfolio, I think, is that it it's too highly correlated to the economic cycle, which also ends up being too highly correlated to people's human capital. And so things like private equity you know, to me is like, can you get that outperformance? Maybe. And if you assume that you can, the challenge with private equity is it's still just businesses. It's equity. It just happens to be private. So there's benefits to that. And I've changed my mind over the years on private equity, uh, the illiquidity being a feature, not a bug, as long as you know that. Um, but I think, uh, I think trend following to me is, has been the one that I think most 
investors, we're if you had to look at where is Meb the weirdest, it's that. And our default allocation is is fifty percent in trend, which I'm I'm guessing there's no advisor or asset manager in the country that's north of 20, 25 percent. I, I think <laughs> ten is probably the comf- comfy space for that. And if you look at trend, you know, for two thousand nine to twenty nineteen was a rough period, right? Like again, S and P creamed everything, but particularly trend. It's done well since then, but uh, but traditionally it has it it shines when it's hitting the fan in, in traditional markets. And then, how do you think about private investments like private real estate or private credit is very popular these days, or or even hedge funds, particularly the ones that actually hedge and might generate an uncorrelated return. You're kind of opening a long discussion on, you know, the the this private public sort of demarcation differentiation over the years, which used to be pretty stark, has been muddled a lot by ETFs, a lot of uh, public vehicles. So you can do a lot of what used to be hedge fund type of strategies in ETFs and public vehicles. So I just mentioned managed futures. We have managed futures ETF. There's a lot of styles and strategies that are applicable now where you have this curve of what used to be high alpha type of strategies that have morphed into all, what you'd almost call like alternative beta. That having been said, there's plenty of things that should not be in an ETF. You want to go invest in cat bonds, like that shouldn't be in an ETF. And, you know, never, um, and it's not appropriate. And there's other areas like fixed income where ETFs don't offer the same tax advantages as they do in active equities. You know, certainly angel investing or private equity, you're not going to be doing that in ETF and really probably shouldn't even, maybe in a mutual fund or interval fund. But um, so there's areas where it's it's totally reasonable. I, I think the challenge for most investors is, do you have the access? Do you have the consistent ability to invest and research and find these funds and strategies? Um, you know, most hedge funds, in my mind, it's you're going to look like just kind of levered beta. Uh, so is that fund actually doing something that's additive? So maybe you're investing in a expert, small cap, private, not small cap, a small private gold streaming investor, right? Like you're not going to find that probably in public markets. Uh, So is it something that's unique, differentiated, interesting, or do they have some special ability uh, or, or an edge and process? I think it's it's certainly doable. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's not easy. (laughs) It's certainly hard, hard to find. Yeah. Particularly net of fees and taxes. That's the biggie, you know, the two and 20, uh, is a large toll. Uh, it's, it is, it is a massive, massive toll. Like you gotta, we, we did a a post on this many moons ago on what is the gross bogey you got to hit on a hedge fund just to get to S and P like returns after tax. And it is a lot of alpha. Like you gotta be damn good. And most of the academic research shows that on average, these managers are good. They just keep most of the alpha for themselves. And so that it's a look, God bless them. It's good to be a private equity manager. It's good to be a hedge fund manager. But, you know, do do those returns flow through to the end client? Uh, You know, where's the customer's yachts? Uh, I think it's I think it's tough. It's it and it gets more competitive by the day. So if we were to summarize, well, what would you say are the main enemies of long term investment success for investors? Look in the mirror, right? Uh, I think the struggle of even if you understand history and you say, "Look, I've my favorite investing book, Triumph of the Optimist." If you go back and read all the history of markets, you will understand. You've studied markets. You have the full playbook of what's happened and why things have happened. You know the future is always going to be different, and so I think the struggle of being able to maintain uh, your goals, your dignity, your approach is is a real challenge for a lot of people. Some people it's not, you know. Um I think uh having 
having a fiduciary in your corner is a, is a big deal. But uh, coming up with a written investing approach at its core, most people, listeners, be honest with yourself. Like we're, you're listening to this, I, I'm, I, you're not going to get feedback from me. But just be honest and ask yourself: Do I have a written investing approach? And we know because we do this poll over and over, and it's like ninety percent don't. So just write it down. It could be an index card; it doesn't have to be a ten pager. Just say, kind of, here's 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 what I'm doing. Here's why. And the challenge is, I think, of when things, when and why things come in and out of the portfolio, what your expectations are going to be, how you're going to measure those, uh, I think is a worthwhile exercise that most aren't going to go through. You know, the winged approach is, is kind of where everyone is. Yeah. And, and I guess one of the key uh, parts of what you just described is have an investment approach and strategy and don't be quick to change it, you know, significantly because if you if you keep doing that, you may be worse off than if you had any strategy, regardless of what it is, the whole time. Yeah, we looked in in kind of this old book where we were talking about if you had perfect foresight on just stocks and bonds, you got to pick the best one each year. Your return is like twenty percent, but if you pick the exact opposite wrong one, your return's about zero. I mean, it's actually positive, I think. So you can't even lose if you tried, right? If like you were perfect at picking the wrong investment every year, you can't even lose. And so, but so many people actually do end up losing, right? They end up losing a lot of money. I can't tell you how many portfolios we've seen where they've had negative and zero returns for many, many years. Uh, and it's because they're always chasing what's hot, right? What, what's what's working. And even the time frames, I think that most people, like Vanguard did a great study that showed uh, if you even look at the winners, so let's pick the ones that have done well and won the amount of years where they trailed or did poorly was way more than people would expect and and could be years in a row, right? So, um, you know, I, 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 let me give a, a good example. I, you know, if you go back to what's the most universally held belief in all of investing, I would argue that it's stocks for the long run, right? Stocks outperform bonds, stocks are the premier asset, you should put all your money in stocks. But if you were to ask the average investor, you know, hey, you, you just bought this active manager, how long are you going to what's the leash you're going to give them? The answer is usually, as you mentioned earlier, three years, right? Like that's their and you say, okay, well, let's apply that to stocks, you know, how long do you think you need to give stocks versus bonds to know that stocks are this good asset? If you said three years, well, that's crazy. Obviously, there's been many, many three-year periods where stocks underperformed bonds. During the pandemic, it was like 40 years where stocks had now not outperformed the long bond or they had about the same returns. So there's been many periods in history, if you look back, where stocks do poorly for 10, 20 years, right? If you go back to the 1800s, it's like 60 years. <laughs> so uh, this this magical belief that you can somehow – judge an active manager on a couple of years, but, you know, but stocks don't get that same pass, right? That, you know, uh, but then they can go decades, decades, imagine decades, you know, most investors think about that. What, what are you going to look like in 20 years? Are you even going to be alive in 20 years? I don't know. Like what, what's the, uh, what's the setup, but 20 years from now, um, they could underperform bonds. And I think most investors just, they don't, it's hard. Like we all want the certainty of the short term but that's, that's unfortunately just not the way markets work. So tying it all together in terms of portfolio construction. So have a sound investment strategy. That strategy should probably include focus on fees, focus on taxes. If you're a taxable investor, focus on diversification and having a good understanding of the path all these different assets can take over time, not overreacting to you know, the path in real time, particularly if it's within that range of expectations. And if anything, rebalancing and buying the things that have done poorly, buying the, you know, uh, selling the things that have done well. And over time, that's a very good strategy. And, and then if you can add more diversification inside your portfolio, it, it seems like if you're on that path, you're going to have a much higher likelihood of long-term success than if you're on the opposite path. Well said. There's a paper we wrote on this topic called the Trinity Portfolio, and it was inspired by a Seattle-based asset investment advisor, Paul Merriman, and the older crowd may know Paul 
he, he used to write an old piece called The Ultimate Buy and Hold Portfolio. But the reason I like this piece is that he started with the S&P and then kept adding the, the diversifying ideas. So he would say, add bonds, and then maybe add REITs and add foreign stocks, and walk you through the process one step all along the way to show, and then show that final portfolio versus the starting portfolio. And it kind of demonstrates how this diversification uh, really helps and works over time. And so we did our variant on that. You know, we took it a kind of a, <laughs> a step further with adding things like value and things like trend following. But I think that's a fun way to frame it where you kind of walk through the portfolio construction process. It's like cooking, you know, where you're kind of going through the recipe to get to the final souffle or omelet or chocolate chip cookies. I, I bought an air fryer, so we're big on uh, on anything air fried now. <laughs> so, um, but getting to the final product, which uh, I think when you mentally walk through it, it's it's a lot more visual, and you can kind of see why uh, that diversified portfolio makes a lot more sense. Particularly when you're zoomed out, you know, you you alluded to this a little bit earlier. We tend to zoom in, and the more we pay attention, the more zoomed in we get. And you just look at recent results and then you extrapolate that into the distant future. But if you were to zoom out and you see that you're on this very sustainable path, you may be less likely to overreact. I want to do this book. Maybe it's a coffee table book. I started to write it with some AI help on the airplane the other day where, you know, we've, we've all in our world seen the 120-year chart of U.S. stocks and it overlays all the crisis events. So Pearl Harbor, Vietnam, COVID, whatever it is, because every year there's something terrible going on. And, you know, you see these periods where stocks did awful, but over time, this just relentless march up of the free markets and capitalism and, and U.S. stocks, uh, you know, creating generational wealth. I want to redo this book, but also include the globally diversified portfolio and sort of you know, talk about the event each year, but then, hey, you know, even though it's short term, you may have struggled or lost X, Y, Z in five, 10, 20 years, you know, you probably ended up okay. I think that's an interesting way to visualize this where you, there have been plenty of pretty tough periods, but over time, uh, it tends to work out. Just over time means a lot longer than most people think. That's right. And it kind of goes back to one thing that you said earlier that that struck me as really insightful is Looking backwards, the downturns are great opportunities, but looking forwards, it's all risk to the downside. And when you zoom out, you're more likely to see it as an opportunity. Yeah, well said. Well, Meb, this has been uh, great. I appreciate you sharing all your insights and uh, spending uh, some time with us. So thank you very much. Been a blast. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode please visit our website at insightfulinvestor.org to access past shows and learn more about our podcast. If you have questions, feel free to email us at info at insightfulinvestor.org. And if you enjoyed the discussion, please subscribe to this podcast to ensure you don't miss future episodes. And don't forget to forward today's conversation to others you think would enjoy listening. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Evoke Advisors, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits. And listeners are reminded that securities trading, commodity trading, and alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors. Listeners should be aware that guests featured on The Insightful Investor may have current or past associations with Evoke Advisors or the host, including as an investment manager of a private fund opportunity by Evoke, or access through an affiliated Evoke fund or as a client. Participation as a guest on the podcast should not be perceived as an endorsement or testimonial with respect to Evoke Advisors, the podcast host, or their services. Similarly, the inclusion of a guest on the podcast does not imply that Evoke Advisors or the host endorses the guest or any company with which they may be affiliated or employed.
Evoke has neither paid nor received compensation from guests for their participation.